Welcome to episode 12 of Raiders of the Lost Art. I am super stoked to be at episode 12 because for anyone who subscribes to the Bible of Spinal Tap, you will know that 11, you'll know the whole concept of the number 11. And when you're on 11, where can you go? Well, in this case, you can go to 12. Since the birth of time, mankind has been furnished with a number of really fundamental questions. Are we alone in the universe? Why is water tasteless? What came first, the chicken or the egg? Would you rather fight a horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? Well, we may never know the answers to these questions, but today we're gonna to tackle another one of these fundamental questions. Do musicians make good coders? On today's episode, I've got two incredibly amazing guests. Um, Daniel Sanders. Daniel is a good mate of mine from Los Angeles. I met him over there. He started playing guitar at the age of 10, got obsessed with music, um, became a pirate radio DJ and worked in a music store, but he was one of those guys, like, like a lot of us, just obsessed with music. At the age of 20, he got involved in the burgeoning tech industry. And since then, he's had many roles, um, primarily building out very major global video platforms uh, from Sony um, to, Vi uh, to Verizon. And currently he's the VP engineering of um, Viacom CBS's platform, Pluto TV. Moving on to Pascal Guillon. Now, Pascal is a new friend. He is an incredible man. He's a uh, multi-platinum music producer. He's been uh, contributed to three Grammy nominations. He's a coder, um, coded some software for Hyperloop in LA. He's also a, an investor into SpaceX, Hyperloop, et cetera, et cetera. He's also a mentor for some educational institutions across the world, including the Conservatory in Paris and Berkeley College of Music. So, um, oh, and by the way, he's also done music for video games. So <laughs> there's a lot going on here. So we've got some great company today. Um, so without that further ado, I'm gonna take you into um, an interview that I recorded uh, a couple of days ago um, with the two guys, and we're gonna tackle the subject, do musicians make good coders? Okay, guys, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us um, all the way across from the sunny, is it sunny over there in USA or? We're in LA, it's always sunny here. Oh, it's always sunny, that's right, yeah. I remember when I lived there, I think we had four days of rain in three years or something, and everyone freaked out <laughs> when it started raining, so. <laughs> um, so guys, um, thanks for joining us. You know what the show's about. It's about, um, do musicians make good coders? Now, I'm no expert, but you know, I know from when I was been coding or building tech or traveling the world or doing my music, people have always asked me that question. And to be totally honest, I, I don't know, but you know, I know from, my, my own story, but I want to share and, and get some other people on, on this show that actually have a lot of experience and, and you know, a lot of accolades, um, which, you know, I mentioned in the beginning. But, you know, what do you guys think? Do you think it's fact or fiction? Do you think musicians make good coders? Dan, what do you reckon? No. Well, <laughs> I'm kind of good. I mean, I think the expectation is that we're going to say yes. So, I, you know, I spent a bunch of time thinking about this before, you know, we, we got together today. And... There's definitely a very, there's a very obvious connection between being involved in technology, engineering, and, um, and music. And throughout my journey in uh, the tech world, I've met many, many uh, people who've got very strong music backgrounds. I can talk about some of them. There's some really interesting ones I've met along the way. But I think it's much bigger than just doing it. Can they write good code? I think the, the engineering mindset and, and music definitely go together. Writing good code is a subset of that that involves a lot of other things too. So I, I guess I'll phrase it as yes with caveats. You know, it's not always, you know, but yeah. writing good code is about um, your style has to be really clean. Not every musician is about doing things in a very orderly fashion. So, so, so yeah, there is a, there's a very strong and interesting connection between music and technology, but the actual practice of writing code, I think gets a little more uh, squirrely, but to tie down. It's not a straight, straight to the ass, let's say. Good yeah. point. Pascal, what do you think? Yeah. So I think I really understand what Dan just said, because yeah. basically most musicians don't make good business people so that says a lot you know um musicians often or artists in general uh you know they are dreaming a lot but when it comes to actually build a plan 
that's a really big problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. However, I have to say that uh, the most impressive profiles I've met, like genius levels, I only know one or two like that who are able to really deliver like incredible software and make music, produce music. However, I think the combination of the two potentially can allow people, allow somebody to go very far. Also because I think people who really revolutionize the world often have this profile of polymath. So able to understand different fields in a deep way and to combine ideas that might be might sound strange at first, but that's how you discover the best stuff or found creative solutions. So I think in, in, in general, I would say to a musician, go away, you don't want to code. But somebody who is really attracted to it and put the, the time, the passion, it can be very, very interesting. But maybe there are the, the percentage of people who can achieve something really cool, uh, maybe smaller. However, what, can they, what they can achieve, I think, can be incredible, actually, this type of people. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, let's start with your journey. Um, you both obviously have both those skill sets. Um, Dan, look, tell me, what came first with you? Was it, was it code and music? Um, and if it was either one of them, how did you then move into that sort of sphere? Yeah, so going back to my family background, my, my mother's side of the family, um, they were my mother's father and, um, sorry, I'm going to turn this down a bit because I'm getting a bit of echo. My, uh, my mother's father and, and uh, his two brothers were both semi-professional jazz musicians in England in the uh, probably the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, one of them was, a, my, my grandfather was a keyboard player, saxophone player, and he played with regional orchestras and things. His brother was a, so I hear, semi-professional wrestler and double bass player. With, with <laughs> Good combo. Yeah. Yeah. And the third brother was a guitar player. Um, so it was definitely, and, and there's recordings out there of some of these guys that I've managed to track down in subsequent years. The most successful of the three of them, I think, was the guitar player who played with Stephanie Rapelli and George Shearing. I've never found recordings with them, but from what I understand, he gigged with them, played with them. So music was in the family. My mother was a listener. Um, you know, a good record collection, and my three cousins were into music. So when I was 10, I basically said, I want to play guitar. She said, uh, if you study classical guitar, I'll buy you an electric guitar in a year. And I still joke with her that I never got the electric guitar. I bought them all. I mean, I have 20 of them, but I bought them all myself. So I became your know, kind of typical guitar obsessed teenager, um, probably like you, Finbar. Um, and at the same time, early 80s, the early Apple computers were coming out. There was a local computer store in the mall near my house. I started taking lessons, putting the putting the five-inch floppy disk in and writing simple basic programs. So they kind of they kind of went in parallel, those two obsessions. I'd say in my teenage years, the guitar was stronger, definitely. Uh, but you know, I kept up with the programming here and there, but the the music thing was definitely stronger. Um, when I was in my late teens, I was friends with guitar players like Oz Noy, who you might know, and people who were just so incredible. And you know, that's, that era of guitar playing was very competitive, so I think I kind of told myself back then, holy Christ, this guy's 18 and he's unbelievable, I better find something else to do. You know, since then I've realized that, you know, you can make music whoever you are, you don't have to be the hardest hot shot in the, in the room. But you know, I pursued alternative methods of uh, self-sustainment. Went to university, worked, started working in the software business, which was really uh, just, you know, it was burgeoning at the time. It was really interesting. Um, and I taught guitar. I just kept up my music. I kept both paths going in parallel, the music obsession. And since then, I played with a bunch of bands. Like, I stopped teaching guitar, but I still practice. And I have a really nice home studio and still record and play with people around town. So I, I try to keep things in parallel basically and career-wise i've spent the last um 15 or so years working on videos and music and 
other kinds of streaming services, e tech. I did uh, ebook stuff as well at Sony, at Verizon, and now Pluto TV for Viacom CBS. And I've met a lot of very interesting musicians uh, along the way who I can mention. I'll tell you some interesting stories along the way. But that's basically my path. Right. Great. Through this thing. Pascal. You again, you've got an, an amazing sort of uh, background, as I mentioned earlier. Like, how, wh where did you start, buddy? Uh, I started in France, if you didn't notice my accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, not at all. Um, so, mus it started by music for me. Um, I started looking at music in a serious way as a teenager, uh, but I went really, really, really hard at that time. So, basically, I got my graduation in classical music, jazz music. I did a lot of workshops with the top jazz players in Europe. Um, I developed a passion for Cuban music, went twice to Cuba, actually ended up playing on stage with some of my I, heroes over there. I was 20, 21. Um, played with a lot of bands, mainly jazz and Latin. Um, but I noticed that I preferred to create than being on stage. I was actually really annoyed to be on stage. <laughs> so I started to compose and produce a lot, and I used social media to place my first composition productions around the world. Um, so that's also what allowed me to come to the U.S. I ended up being invited by a, a legend in the, in the music industry, Walter Afanasiev, uh, the guy who was producing the biggest Maria Carey ballads and Whitney Houston and Kenny G and all that stuff. So I came here for a month. It was insane. Um, the first two albums I worked on uh, during my first two weeks ended up getting three Grammy nominations, selling 10 million copies worldwide. Um, so I moved. <laughs> <laughs> I moved to Los Angeles, worked with tons of people, got some publishing deals, managers, whatever, got a bunch of, keep you know, having more and more placements. But at the same time, I started to be bored a little bit because I've been doing that for 10, 15 years. And uh, I randomly found some finance people on YouTube. I do tons of research on YouTube all the time. And I discovered especially some, uh, some traders and it really caught my attention. So I actually fully embrace a new life in the finance world. I trained as a trader and a quant with the finance guy in New York, some of the most serious firms in New York. That's how I started to program because they push their traders to become bionic. So discretionary, but also use the computer to maximize your trades, to, to optimize your results. So that's how I started to mess around with the programming. So it was very interesting. And so, you know, I kept developing my thing and Around 2012, 2013, I was doing two days in one. Morning was finance and the afternoon was music with clients or whatever. It was <laughs> too much, <laughs> too long days anyway. But then I, I kept basically in Los Angeles. I also started to hang with entrepreneurs here. I never really felt in tune with the music circles for some reason. You know, whenever I was done making music, I wanted to hang or learn from people who do something else. And well, in Los Angeles, we have insane entrepreneurs. I, I ended up uh, in a private circle of the top entrepreneurs in Los Angeles, and I learned a lot from them and new opportunities came. That's how I connected uh, with the people who built the first Hyperloop company started to help them on different levels. I helped building the team. I made music for the videos, uh, introduced people, and started to code as well. And all the way to actually making a whole software for the company that they use on a daily basis now. Um, I spent most of the year last year building that. And, um, and it's been super challenging, rewarding, super happy to have done it. So that's where I'm now. I know I'm 
I'm doing tons of research every day. So that's for my finance decisions or to find great opportunities or always be on the lookout for great projects or whatever I need to be aware of. So, you know, for my investments decisions, um, of course, still music and whatever software I would like to build next myself as well as my research and what I want to go for after that. So that's where I'm at now. Yeah, well, great. Great, great, great insights there, guys. Um, it's re really inspiring. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, like a lot of the connections that, I, that I've worked with in, in Los Angeles and New York when I was living there, um, you know, guys like Jeff Skunk Baxter, Brian May, you know, there's these, these like heroes of music, Thomas Dolby, um, Jeff Rundgren, you know, there's guys that sort of, um, even my, my, I guess my relationship with the Zappa family, you know, you've got this, all these really interesting musicians who have got these, um, this detail and this, this ability to visualize and whether that's being a coder or whether it's being an architect of technology or systems or platforms, just wanted to ask you guys, do, do you find that there's people in your periphery and your networks that, um, that you can also point to that actually are musicians and have some level of that sort of um, that capability? Dan? Yeah. So you named a few good names. You know, before we talked, I was trying to go through in my head who are the top who are the top ones that I can think of? Who the, you know, so of course, Tom Schultz from Boston came yeah. to mind. Les Paul, um, inventing tape machines and sure. doing crazy things with recording. Avery Fisher was a classical violinist who did uh, stuff with loudspeaker, microphone technology. Now, you know, Avery Fisher Hall in New York's named after him, but he was a real techie. But Jeff Skunk Baxter is a good one you named. Um, another really good one that I came across at Sony. Um, he was, he's still there, I think. Um, his name's Albi Galutin. He's um, basically credited as being the first person to put a commercial drum loop on a recording. Probably somebody did it before him, but he's the first person to do it on a massive record, mm. which is staying alive. So um, he was a senior vice president of technology at Sony while I was there, and I got a lot of chances to talk to him. And he's one of those guys. He's Berkeley grad, he can play play you under the table musically, but he's also really deep on new technologies, inventions, software. Um, but yeah, the list goes on and on. I mean, the, when I was at Verizon, our, the president of our division was a Dick Grove School of Music graduate who played bass on stage with the Scorpions and mm -hmm. toured with the Red wow. Chili Peppers. <laughs> um, our, um, currently at Viacom CBS, one of my peers, our uh, business intelligence, data, big data uh, VP is somebody who has studio engineer credits with Prince, Madonna, Michael Jackson, and is a very good bass player. He got into the soft, pure software, um, as he told me, through um, designing listening station experiences for Tower Records, the CD right. station software so he got into that he decided he was going to get out of studio engineering get into tech that and he ended up going into being a dba after that database analyst yeah. got into data so yeah you just keep meeting these goes people. On and on and on. yeah what about you pascal yeah yeah i think about two person uh you might know one of them who is a fairly young guy uh, do you know the brand Slate Digital? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. So the guy who designed the algorithm is Fabrice Gabriel, right. the French right. guy, okay. a good friend of mine. Okay. So he's a musician and he's nuts about algos. Right. <laughs> you okay. know, that's what, that's what he does. He, he pretty much did uh, everything, you know, that, that is responsible for, you know, the Slate Digital stuff or the algo stuff. So I know that person, and I have another friend that he wants to stay under the, the radar, so I won't mention his name, but uh, that's the type of profile I was talking about, like really prodigy level. So basically, he's a hedge fund manager, video game designer, and musician. So basically, he runs like a multi-million dollar hedge fund, except that it's fully autonomous, nothing to tweak, Nothing to change. It's been on for years and years and years. Wow. Nothing to adjust. He created the thing when he was 2021, and it's on, and that's all. Uh, wow. So he's bored. So he makes video games. 
So he made a virtual reality flying video game, which is absolutely insane. You can actually, it's on Steam. You can go play it if you want. I could send you a link mm. if you want. And he makes music as well. He makes the music for, for the video game and like orchestral music. It's not like, you know, stupid hip hop stuff. It's actually yeah. big musical orchestral stuff. Yeah, right. So, and he writes the most incredible stuff uh, I read about philosophy and tech and music and all of that combined together in the future so it's like it's just crazy so this type of people really change you know have the potential to change to change the world mm. like some of the names you mentioned as well i actually met through that guy some of the biggest guys on wall street ever i didn't even know who they were but they ended up coming to my place and the next day i googled them i was like Holy crap! That was a friend of Warren Buffett. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, it's a uh, you know I, I really um I love BT's work, Brian Transow. You know, like uh, he obviously developed software um you know with with his brake tweaker and all that sort of stuff, and just that that ability to sort of assemble all these little tiny pieces in 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 an orchestrated way, I just find really really fascinating. Um, oh, yeah. can, I just wanted to ask you guys. Um, to me, it seems like, you know, from, from my understanding, if I run a visualization over writing code, if you look at a bunch of code, it looks very complex. Just like if you scored uh, what you're putting out there, if you actually put it down on a piece of paper, it would look yeah. complex. There's a, there's a deep hierarchical architecture to it, if you can look at it through that lens. But when you're creating, you're often not thinking about that. You're just sort of thinking about playing a bit and how that works with something else. Um, you know, do you think that 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 complex hierarchy and being able to look at it from two sides, do you think that that is a common trait amongst um, technologists and musicians? Dan? Um, yeah. I mean, I think the term should be something like mental architecture or something. It's like you're building a picture in your head of something you want to put together and then you go for it. And sometimes you make false starts and you rewind and you go again. But whether you're building a software system or writing a piece of music, you you start off with some kind of idea what you want to do. Um, if it's a piece of music, then you know I want to work with these compositional parameters or these instruments or these sounds. Or if it's a piece of software, you you have certain modules you need to put together, certain inputs to the system, outputs, things you want to do. So I think it's about just building that picture in your head and then gradually working there. And even I think even if you're doing that intuitive stuff that you mentioned, you've still absorbed so much of the technicalities that you're still doing that stuff. You just, you don't have to stop to think. And as we all know, like the really incredible improvised, if we're talking jazz or improvised music, say, they've internalized it so much, they can just play the most insane things without even sweat breaking a sweat, you know? Um, so I think it's the same when you watch a great coder lay down lines of code, they can just, hammer it out like maniacs yeah and uh, so yeah it's definitely not a million miles apart yeah there's actually Pascal. it makes me it makes me think uh these guys are not are not musicians but they combine the computer science with other fields and i think there is two really good examples in the blockchain world right now we have vitalik and daniel larimer there's probably other ones but these guys are so much into philosophical concepts and rewiring completely the world how the world function it's huge it's unbelievable so i'm actively always following these guys as well because i mean when i listen to them i'm like i i, I don't feel very clever you know <laughs> <laughs> but they have the ability of like combining these different fields and like through code actually it's the beauty about it is that because of what they put together, they are like pushing pressure on governments to actually adapt their regulations to technology because you can't stop it. What can you do? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, it brings an interesting point when Dan was talking about improvisation, you know, like um, to be someone who can improvise and make sense over playing over complex changes or over anything really and just to be able to be in the moment there's a lot of things going on it's not only understanding what what's happening music wise it's also happening what's happening energy wise with the players around you timing dynamics so there's all of these other sort of sensory sort of things that happen in being able to improvise and slot in the pocket and it's 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 
the timing is really important. So is the dynamic, so is the note choices. And it's sort of when you get to that point where you can synthesize all of these input data, this big data in a way uh, coming in and be able to sort of um, look at how you're going to create it, how you naturally create that. It's it's um, it's it's sort of self-expression, but it's sort of I think. You know, when you talk, um, Pascal, about that, the, these guys that are changing the, the, the way, they're, they've got, they're visionaries, but the visionary is based on a foundational knowledge, but they have yeah. this ability to synthesize seeing things yes. beyond the periphery, beyond what's right yes. in front of them, as well as understanding what's right in front of them. And to me, that sounds like a great sort of um, segue from this ability to improvise music. You know, I, I often, when I'm coaching a lot of businesses, I talk about improvising in business, this ability mm -hmm. to, to look at not only what the, the data tells you, but what the people you're talking to, how to read the energy of someone that's coming at you yeah. to actually, you know, so there's a lot of other dynamics going on in a conversation, in a boardroom or whatever that is. And I look... I, I don't know whether it comes from me being able to improvise in music, whether that's something that makes it easier for me. Um, I remember when I did my TED talk, one of the things that they said was, um, you've got to actually send your presentation to the TED oh, people yeah. and then they review it. And I'm like, well, no, my design concept is I actually read the audience and that's part of my live thing. So I'm always mm -hmm. improvising. And they, they, it got knocked back a few times, but I eventually did it and I did it that way. And, it, it, right. and other people were like, how do you do that? And to me, it's like, it's not actually hard, but I wonder if right, you right, think right. that that might be part of some of our training that we have naturally to improvise. What do you, what do you guys think of that? I, I actually remember really well my workshops with these top jazz players. Basically, I think there is a very important point about the ability to break down things. And it's the same thing in coding and in music. Like if I remember these jazz guys showing me piano exercises or whatever and slowing down the tempo, if you work with a great drummer, for example, they teach you how to break down the beat and how to articulate around the beat. And you have to slow things down, being patient to deeply understand what's going on and then you can practice that accelerate and i like to say i like to practice and work on something till it becomes second nature and it becomes magic at this point so i think people the people who have the best results had the discipline probably in the past to go through that deep learning that foundation that patience at some point, I was, and maybe it's the same for you, Finn, but I was spending 10 hours a day on my piano, just yeah. like, a, you know, the, the real classical pianist. And that's patient-wise, it's insane. And you really need that when you code because, well, you have to break things down to understand. And you constantly run into issues. So you have no other solution to break things down and then step-by-step, step, okay, that's, I got it, the next, 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 next. So I think it's really, really uh, a key point between the yeah, two. Yeah. yeah, great, great point. I mean, you know, the thing, your, your talking point for today was do they make good coders? But I th what I was trying to say earlier is you can sort of rewind and it's really, music is mathematical at its, at its core. Um, yeah, it depends. You know, Rhythms are mathematical, frequencies are mathematical. I know about what you've been doing with your other company, Finbar. So music is maths in a way. It's kind of one mm -hmm. and the same. So the fact, you know, and programming languages evolved out of maths and computing evolved out. So yeah. it's no surprise that there are deep connect. And, you know, there's a famous book, which I think I've probably read half of, Gödel Escher Bach. Has anyone here read the full thing? I've tried no. to read it. It's basically, it's from the 80s, I think, is it Douglas Hofstad, or I forget the author's name, but it's basically a book that draws parallels between logician, Kurt Gödel, Hungarian, Escher's drawings, MC Escher, and Bach, and basically connecting music, maths, and logic. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, so it's all, it's a very, it's a pretty dense book. I remember thinking at some point I got to read this and making it halfway <laughs> through. <laughs> okay, time to go. For that. Yeah, stuff it. I'll go and practice. <laughs> I go do something fun. <laughs> yeah, but, and the other points I wanted to make is if um, the other sort of duh thing of the obvious thing is look at the way music is made today. We wouldn't be there without people understanding programming and computers. Yeah. 
And that's not even new. Going back to a 90, if you're programming an 808 drum machine sure. from 1983, you're programming a computer, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, to yeah, get that's a that's a really interesting point. Yeah, like uh, yeah. you know, people seem to look at one and the other, but. They're, they're, they really are, there's a real hybrid. To be a musician these days, you, you know, you're interacting with technology all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, for sure. So um, another thing I wanted to talk about was um, this concept of, you know, there's all these buzzwords in the business world. And, and you know, I, I think what, I think Pascal sort of touched on it, this ability to, you, when, you, when you're practicing your guitar uh, or your keyboard or you're getting into the groove and you're spending all this time on getting that detail and going down and getting the timing right, getting the scales right, getting your finger, right, what, whatever that is, you're just putting that, you know, in, when I talk to businesses, they talk about resilience as a word. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, well, as a musician, to get any good, you've got to be resilient. You've got to stay with the practice and get good at it, right? And to be a coder too, you've got to, Put the deep you've got to be detailed but also be abstract <laughs> you know? totally. i feel like the effort that i put in and I, i'm not going to claim i'm the i'm the greatest coder ever i feel like what i've done in recent years i'm more like a band leader pulling people together but yeah. right. i feel like when i did decide i wanted to be really good at writing code the type of work i put into it was very similar to what i put into getting good at guitar yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Feels yeah. The, at least it feels the same it took the way, yeah. absolutely know. Absolutely. Well, it, it, yeah. it's fascinating to me. There's um, a, a younger generation that seems so like when when you're mentoring them, it's like, oh, that that didn't work. So it's a, I've failed at this, and it's like, well if, well, if you're playing guitar or playing keyboards and you play a wrong chord, you don't go, that's it, I failed. You just you just <laughs> practice it again, right? <laughs> and to us, that's common sense, and as all musicians, that's common sense. But I, I wonder if that that ability to be determined and to be um, um, very focused is is uh, yeah. part of the makeup of a good musician and a yeah. good coder, you know? And you know, one, one more thing I'll say on this is, I don't think it's necessary just about being a musician. I think you can also, I think listening is underrated. Like you can be a really good listener of music. You don't play an instrument, but you really understand music as a listener. You don't have to know all the, well, you know, chord inversions yeah. or anything, but that can also really inform your, your uh, activities in other like I've met people who are really deep programmers who are not necessarily musicians themselves, but they have the ear. The yeah. ear is a bit, the ear is underrated, I guess. Yeah, they can be, yeah. they can pull apart the mix and hear different things. Yeah, and you know, like for music producers, we are always really aware of how people will react or not to what we're putting together. You know, it's like we know we are, we are interacting with people in a profound way through the music. So we know. So I think, you know, when, once, when you design a software and you know potentially a lot of people are going to use it, well, you always, uh, the musician, the music producer who does that will, uh, be really aware of taking care of user interface. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, okay, how the person is going to feel in front of that? Is it easy? Is it clear? Straight to the point? No, no confusion. That, that, that kind of stuff. So I think that a music producer is pretty good at, you know, having like, we have to be in the details, but also really seeing the global picture basically i think that's a that's an amazing point pascal last the last episode of raiders of the lost art um i covered a a, a modified version of a design thinking the ideo design thinking framework for musicians because um, mm -hmm. a lot of musicians as you started off when you mentioned today right at the get-go a lot of musicians aren't business orientated or they don't have that skill um and i just think that a lot of them haven't developed that it's not that they're they're bad right. at it it's just that they haven't actually needed to but you know i think in today's times to be able to think about your audience and who's going to receive the sound as sort right. of you know beyond being a producer you know it's it's a skill that all musicians should have just in their playing you know to be able to know what yeah. how that's translating to the audience rather than just how it translates to yeah. me it's sort of yeah. it's an evolution i think you know um in and which i think is really, really because important I'm sure you noticed, uh, we know that even very, very good musicians don't specifically make good producers be because they, they don't have this full picture. Though I know tons of jazz players who just can't help themselves and we just play too much. <laughs> it's just like, 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 shut up. <laughs> you know, like, come on. So they don't have this 
I remember, like, for example, um, Scott Storch, you know, he always said he likes to make simple, simple tracks to serve the singer or the rapper so that it sounds good on the radio and easy for people to understand and not having too much stuff going on that you can digest, can't digest. Well, same thing if I put the software on and I see there is too much stuff going on, I'm like, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. D I, think, you know, I think, you know, like any framework that gets you thinking about um, intricacy and, and design and architecture is going to be good for your coding. And there's not many frameworks like that that are better than music. So, you know, I think part of it, and, and, or, or, and also music obviously is very attractive to people, appealing to people. So it's not strictly speaking the fact that you're doing music. I think it's just the parameters that, you know, what comes along with it, that, the, that it forces you to just think about in a sophisticated way. And I don't mean like you're drinking the finest wines, <laughs> sophisticated. <laughs> I, mean, I mean just... Uh, like you, you, you called it abstract, but um, yeah, just uh, thinking about all these little detail, detail, being you know detail oriented, and just being able there's, to. There's... <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. There's there's probably one thing we didn't talk about too, but I don't know how much we really know about it. But it's all the way uh, related to actually health. Uh, we know that for older people, music can be a life saver. Like we know people who are deeply sick, who are actually impacted in a profound way by, by music. So we know it has a profound effect on, on the brain. Uh, I, we probably, we certainly don't understand everything, but I'm sure that because of all that music practice and that listening, of course, like somebody who gets into calling, well, the, the brain is not the same because it's been exposed to so much of that stuff. So in a subconscious way, I'm not sure in, you know, in what details, but um, it must be playing a role somewhat as well, uh, you know, just because you've been exposed to that and learned to appreciate that. And anything like that, I think uh, any experience in life it's changing you somewhat and helping for whatever, you know, you're trying to accomplish. So, uh, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, it's fascinating you say that. I, I know Dan knows that, you know, there's a, a number of, there's a technology I've been working on with my partner, Ahmed Zappa, whose dad was Frank Zappa, obviously. So we have a business in Los Angeles called Resonics and we're working, we've been working on, um, recalibrating mixes, audio mixes, back to harmonic based tuning, which means that we're slicing oh. a mix into 48 slices where it's four notes over, over, uh, so twelve a musical scale over four octaves. Then we re reharmonize or repitch each note range frequency back to a more sort of uh, human centric or uh, a uh, but basically back to these frequencies that are more human uh, that have a, a greater response to human physiology. And then mm. we're adding HRTFs, binaural beats, some of these other psychoacoustic cues to try and use music to create an elevated um, experience in through the human physiology. And so, look, we're, we're still at early stages yeah. on it, but we've got two granted yeah. patents. We've done a lot of trials okay. with EEG analysis in Switzerland, and we're seeing some really interesting results. Um, we've, yeah. we've still got issues with phase and some other bits and pieces going on, but um, we're, we're eventually looking at putting this on a chip, so it's in silicon. But at the moment, it's a okay. manual process. But again, we're really fascinated about what, how we can take the science that's been applied in medicine and other different areas of, of sound frequencies and then apply that over what's being used through a 12-tone temperament Western tuning system. How do we recalibrate that back to a more harmonic Based tuning, right. and then if we add these frequencies, what does that do? So that's just a project I'm passionate about. So I'm, I'm glad you yeah. mentioned that. I think it's really there's a lot, yeah, yeah. A lot we don't know. It's like the deep blue sea. There's a lot, exactly. you know the galaxies, um, but we all do yep. know, and I think everyone would agree that music does have a way to touch you that's deeper than just the auditory sound. It's incredible. You know, I, I think uh, my most profound experience in music was when I was in Cuba in my early twenties. I, I felt I had an experience with the truth because, you know, it's really based on African heritage. And I just felt that I went back to the center of the world where like everything comes from, you know? 
So that was profound, really profound. And of course, you know, whenever you're impacted that much, it translates somewhat to whatever you're doing next, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's fascinating studying biochronology, which is the, the different clocks that are happening in the biology of, your, of the human physiology. And you know, we, our blood's going around our body three, three, r- roughly three minutes. We have different uh, heartbeats, different. There's all sorts yeah. of different clocks going on. And, and yeah. this concept of entrainment through, you know, the limbic system. And, and look, I, I get really into all this stuff. I just find it really fascinating. It's, but, I've got uh, a good movie recommendation for you, Finbar. Yeah. Um, that, that record cover behind me is yeah. Milford Graves. He's a jazz drummer, and he did a lot of stuff around body rhythms and things like that. So there's a documentary. He's, he died a year or two ago, but there's a, doc, there's a movie that came out about him called Full Mantis. It's really Full great. It's, it's basically about like biorhythms and uh, how music nice. fits the body oh, and everything. I got it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Send, it. Send, send us that uh, in an email if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah that, would, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I look, yeah. guys, it, this, has been, this has been great. Uh, there's just one other thing that I really would like to just cover off with you. And I'm not trying to get political or anything. It's just a general question is that, you know, you guys are both very accomplished in, in, in both sides of this, these spheres, these two worlds that have sort of co- connected. And, and I, look, I, I'm very lucky as well. Um, I'd just like to ask your opinion about, you know, um, do you think like learning to mu- music at an early age helps wire the brain or teach skills that, that, other things don't teach and if so do you think it's that you know our education system is sort of like that we're we're fundamentally not understanding that this there's this correlation between early learning and what music does to you know the success of how we think or i don't know dan yeah i i oh, pascal uh yeah, yeah. I, oh yeah sorry sorry um because no, i have ideas coming to my mind go, so go, go, I'm, go, go. I'm getting excited go with the flow, go with the flow. <laughs> So uh, I, I remember um, Elon Musk created uh, a school for his children. So that says a lot, just yeah. that. And, and I had a wake-up call maybe 10 years ago uh, because of health specifically. And I'm like, how comes I didn't know that? How comes everybody doesn't know about all these things when they leave school? This is not normal. Um, so to me, yes, uh, the current, and even it makes me think about a famous trader in the UK, Anton Creel, uh, that pretty much explains that that's the way the system is built. Um, uh, you won't learn the tricks to have a great life in school because well, if these teachers knew these tricks, they wouldn't be uh, doing that right now. <laughs> so it's a, it's a problem, that's for sure. And, uh, and I also think that uh, I think as long as people keep their inner child, like curiosity, and I think unfortunately most people lose that because of modern lifestyle, you have to get a job, you have to do this, you have to do that. But if you manage to protect yourself against that lifestyle and keep time for yourself and keeping the curiosity going, I feel like I'm, I'm like still, like still a child because like I'm so curious and researching all day long whenever I can, basically. And that's how you learn very fast when you get so excited about something. And I think probably, I think it's quite known that yeah, when, when, when you're a kid, you just assimilate things like so easily. And especially if you like it, that's when you just eat it <laughs> and then digest it fast. So I think, yeah, I think I, think I would always be uh, uh, very uh, focused on exposing young people to the best experiences possible as early as possible. Yeah, wow, that's, I, uh, that, uh, I just love what you said there, Pascal. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's right. resonates with me so well. Dan, what do you reckon, buddy? Um, yeah, I think, you know, obviously, you know, we've, we've, we've run through that. I think, yeah, of course, music, uh, you know, being involved in music helps you, tr- helps train your brain, and it's one of the great ways to do it. I think there's other ways, you know, if you learn a second language, it, it'll probably uh, help mm-hmm. your coding too. Well, music know? is a second language, right? 
Exactly, yeah. And I know you speak Australian and English. And, yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> I, I, I come from Liverpool. I can talk like that too, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I think, the, you know, one thing we didn't mention, I think in a corporate environment, you know, working on any field, one thing people do tend to forget with coding, the, people think of coding as a practice, but I often try to rem remind people it's, it is also about creativity, coming up with creative. It's not just about writing solid code that doesn't crash, that's efficient, that uses your memory and CPU. And it's also about being creative with how you solve problems. And of course, being involved in music is going to help you with that. Um, so yeah, this, you know, I can't really speak to the state of education in the US or any other country, but I think it's definitely a good thing to uh, to force people to force them to play. But I don't know actually about the forcing kids to play violin and piano. But I think that can turn people off music. But make it available. And, and you know, another thought that occurred to me is um, at various companies I've worked at, a lot of the stellar coders that we we work with tend to come out of the East Bloc former Soviet Union, and they did have typically, in addition to strong mathematical educations, they often had very good musical education. Kids were playing piano young, so I don't know if this- uh, And it was uh, cold, so cold. they had to stay indoors yeah. and practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Those are my thoughts. Not, a, <laughs> not, as, not as good as Pascal's, but yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, guys, um, well, thanks so much for your, t did you want to say something else, Pascal? Oh yeah, just the, the the last thing I was thinking about um, um, that friend I have that is unusually skilled. It everything is linked in their brain, which is it's just crazy. Like you know, basically, if they hear music, uh, they know the story. Like they they have a full movie going on in their brain. And so everything is linked like that. And this type of people, I mean, I really don't know many of them, but the few I know, even when they talk, very often I have to pause them and I'm like, wait a second, I have to think about what they just said because it's just so uh, uh, clear for them, but uh, not for the rest <laughs> of the population, you know? Yeah. But so that's what I'm saying, I'm like, for them, you know, there would be certainly some, some some pieces of code that would maybe sound like something. Like, you know what I mean? Or yeah, it's like when people hear something, they see numbers or whatever. So they're able to... Synesthesia, is it? Yeah. What is it called? I mean, synesthesia? It's, yeah, I think, I think it's... Yeah. yeah. I think that's that. So, yeah, it's a yeah. when you can hear a color or you a color. I forget. I've forgotten the exact definition, but it's a connection between the senses. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think it's related to color and uh, numbers. I'm not sure. I will have to look it uh, again. But it's really interesting because I think you know it. That's something that should be looked at. Why these people are able to make the connection? Because I'm, I, I think I'm sure that means that you can once again find creative solution if you find an idea in that world and bring into another world and yeah boom yeah yeah well guys been amazing thank you so much for joining me um really thank you loved your insights it's been great um you know i hope that this episode helps other people just you know start to keep being curious keep exploring not putting the bridges up and going oh that's that's all too hard it's not it's just it's just as Pascal said, be curious, get the passion, let that drive yeah. you um, and see where the journey of life takes you. So on that note, I'm going to thank everyone for coming and we'll see you next week on Raiders episode 12. See you guys. Thanks again. Thank you, thank you very much.